it might be fair to say that, that you're one um, among a, a burgeoning group of contemporary artists who are kind of taking back easel painting and taking it back into the galleries. Was that ever part of a conscious decision on your part, if not to be recherche, to, to certainly go against the grain, the well, conceptual no, grain. No, it wasn't actually, because I, I, I was always going to be, a, a, you know, always going to paint. I was always going to put paint on canvas. I had an uncle who died recently, actually, but who introduced me to oil, oil paint and, and the qualities of it when I was about 11. So it, it was never something that was, that was alien or, or strange. And, and when I was at Goldsmiths, I was obs absolutely obsessed with them. Um, Jeff Koons, he opened the doors to anything. Anything could be art, and and he made ever, anything possible. And and of course we had Duchamp before that, but he was the man of the time. But what I loved about it was that I still wanted to paint. I still I didn't want to do work with ready-made. I didn't want to work with um, you know in that way. I still wanted to do that impossible act of filling in a space on a canvas on your own in a studio. It was this one that I was particularly taken by how much lift you got with these lines. Tell me about the technique. I want to know about the technique. What did you do? Well, every canvas is primed and then the next layer is a fluorescent. And then I sort of layer it with oils, sand it back maybe, and then I'll use gravity. So I'll, I'll turn the canvas and use varnish to pull the paint. So I'll put paint here and get the paint to be dragged down and then I'll let it rest. And then I've got all these um, T-squares made mm -hmm. that were quite sort of substantial. And I used those to literally draw these lines and, uh, you know, this way and that way. And then this grid was created. And it's a bit like being an alchemist because I'm using these materials day in, day out and working out how they work, what are their characteristics and what I do, you know, how much terps or varnish I can put on to unpick it. Mm. And that's how it sort of... It then, it then disrupts the surface. With all of these, I mean, the T-square seems latent. The tool has informed the work. Exactly. But this ridging effect where you get this, you know, like it's almost scooped out, is that yeah. something that's coming with the turps? Using the turps and the varnish, so that would have been happened this way. So yeah. that would have been the gravity. So I'm, and as with all the work I've been using, you know, been painted for the last 20 years, the gravity's this sort of invisible paintbrush. Here we have some of the same elements, the same sense of the graticule or the grid that's disrupted. Uh, but, but tonally it's very, very different. It hasn't got that slickness and that kind no. of skeletal feeling to it. It's much more smudgy, it's much more bambooey. <laughs> it's much more bambooey. This is very mm. bambooey. It's very bambooey. And it's also the, it's sort of like a negative of the paint that was there before. So mm. these, these lines here... Yeah, so um, I'm thinking like beton brut, you know, it's yeah. the, the, the impression in concrete. Or... Exactly. It's a sort of trace of what was before. Mm. So every, every, everything that's there is sort of exposing what was there before. Often they remind me of Xeroxes, mm. you know, photocopies, something that's sort of been repeated and repeated and repeated. And then I put this orange circle on just to put an orange circle on it. I like the absurdity of it. We've sort of skated by this, but in a way this is kind of not exactly representative because they are so different. But let's talk a bit about what's happening with pattern in this because it is really pretty complicated, isn't it? I mean, in some places the pattern is exploding into kind of curlicues and shreds of paint. In other places it's obliterated and then is kind of re-emerging in a moiré pattern. Yeah, there. this was the painting that, that nearly died several times. It's called Darkness and Light, so I wanted to play with that idea of sort of depth, use it, you know, playing with the pigments for the depth of the canvas, but, you know, it's patterns, but it's not patterns. It's, there's a, there's a, a grid formation, but it's been sort of disrupted. You can even see in here, in the, in mm. the black on the black, there's sort of imagery, you know, uh, patterns in there. But I wanted to, it's not about patterns at all, it's about, it's a, it's a feeling. But would you be angry with me if I said, it makes me think of, you know, over and under exposure. It makes me think of a photographic plate to some extent. No, not at all. Absolutely not. No, because I, I feel that when I look at it, and especially when I started painting them, I was, the, the photographic feeling um, of some of them is um, really quite sort of um, domineering. We were brought up in an era where our bedrooms had wallpaper on them. Mm, Whereas exactly. bedrooms don't generally have wallpaper now. One of the reasons I wanted to use the pattern 
was not for nostalgic reasons. It's similar to the grid. You know, we find solace in patterns. And so if you want to be calm, you'll want to see something that's ordered. And so it was a good way of a good, a good excuse to use to, to, to then disrupt it. It's odd the way we look at patterns, particularly in childhood. I mean, thinking back to looking at patterned wallpaper, lying in bed looking at patterned wallpaper, and the way in which you almost educate yourself in trompe l'oeil using patterns very yeah. early on. You look at them and you think, oh, but if I look really close, mm. it loses its third dimension. Yeah. Or if I look really close, every instance and iteration of the design becomes an individual rather than yeah. part of the collective and then you move away from it and it simply becomes a pattern again. Yeah. And, and we reach to pattern for, for reassurance and as a kind of scaffolding. Yeah, definitely. And that's why I like to then disrupt it or, or play around with it and, you know, overlay it, smear it, smudge it. And the thing is, in, with, with painting, if you... If you use a smear, a smudge, a splash, it can relate to, you know, Richter, mm. Pollock, Soutine. Every shift, every move of paint or with your paintbrush or palette or a rag or whatever can relate to something else. And so I wanted to sort of use all those sort of tropes, but, um, but in a sort of irreverent way. The use of these, found, as it were, found patterns. Yeah. It, it, it exists also uh, in, in kind of tension with these much more kind of scumbled surfaces, these very loose brush strokes on top. Do we think of them as being on top? Do we think of them as being underneath? I mean, how important is that well, idea I think of relief? Well, I think they're attacked. So I sort of attacked the canvases. So I was doing the pattern pieces and then um, I wanted more to happen on them. And so I just sort of picked up paint and just started smearing it on the canvas and sort of thinking of um, something like Richard Hamilton's dirty protest and that sort of thing and, and using brushes and whatever and wanted it to be unconscious. So not, I didn't want them to be sort of thought out or thought through. I wanted to be unwieldy with them. This is your most stare roddy though and kind of New Yorky. Yeah, I put mm. this in because it, I, I actually showed this in the exhibition in New York. But I brought it back here because I thought it was quite nice because it reflected the fishing houses outside. Yeah, the lovely fishing house. Yeah. And the nets. And the nets, exactly. <laughs>